Thank you, Ruth. Uh, first of all, I'd like to really uh, thank uh, Ben and Barbara and all the SIARC team for inviting me over here and giving me an opportunity to speak. What I'm going to speak today is uh, uh, really talking about risk management of cultural heritage and say, uh, try to discuss what is this paradigm, uh, paradigm shift that we are talking about by bringing in risk as, as, as the concept uh, when we look at uh, heritage. So uh, when we talk about risks, uh, we start to think about what kind of disasters have happened and how heritage has been impacted. And we have so many examples. We have been seeing since morning uh, many examples uh, of uh, heritage being damaged uh, due to disasters. And I'm going to run through a few slides to show uh, these kind of uh, impacts on heritage sites uh, due to various kinds of disasters. Uh, this is very recent. It's, in fact, less than a week ago, uh, there has been a devastating earthquake in Philippines. And I'm sure you are aware of that, which has, in fact, damaged churches like these, which are heritage sites in Philippines, protected nationally. And this is what was before the earthquake, but this is well, what's left of it. So this is the kind of uh, damage that heritage has sustained or, uh, due to this earthquake. Precious heritage in different parts of the world has been damaged. And this heritage is not just heritage which is grand, is of world heritage status. It's also heritage which is very intimately connected to people. It's part of people's everyday lives. For example, this very important monastery and palace in Bhutan, which was very much intact until a fire occurred uh, two years ago, uh, or a year ago, in fact, which damaged not just this building, this important monastery, but also very important religious artifacts that were there inside. And in fact, several of those important artifacts have been, uh, could not just be recovered. They just, could, uh, they just were lost forever. Uh, we are talking not just about earthquakes and uh, fires, we are also talking about flooding. And we see that many heritage sites are now being increasingly vulnerable to floods. And climate change is making this kind of damage uh, much more uh, uh, persistent. And we see that more and more sites are being damaged because of higher frequency and intensity of flooding. I'll come back to this issue of climate change uh, later during the presentation. Uh, climate change is not just, what climate change is doing is what heritage is not used to. So in areas where there was not heavy rainfall, we are suddenly encountering a phenomenon of increased rainfall and heritage which has sustained itself for many, many generations is suddenly finding itself really vulnerable because of this changing patterns of climate. Uh, uh, this is a, a disaster that happened in Himalayan region in India uh, earlier this year. And this was one of the most important pilgrimage routes for Hindus in, in the northern part of the country. And a lot of important temples and uh, religious uh, shrines were damaged because of uh, flash floods that happened, uh, which brought in a lot of uh, silt and also resulted in landslides and erosion. So we had uh, a great devastation because of this uh, event. Not only we are talking about natural events here, we have to also talk about these human-induced events. And we already had a, a presentation by Peter where he elaborated on what kind of dangers are there to heritage sites due to conflicts. And we see that important sites like Timbuktu are which is in fact also on world heritage, are now, is now uh, getting so much damage because of the conflict situation uh, in these areas. Uh, this is uh, Syria, where Aleppo, another important world heritage site, has been damaged. And we, we keep on in, uh, listening to these kind of sad events where heritage is becoming more and more vulnerable to these events. But we should not just talk about these catastrophic events. These are very um, alarming. These suddenly catch our attention. But let's not forget that it's not just these events which are dramatic that are of importance to us or that we should be concerned about. We should be equally concerned about these slow and progressive events, these slow and progressive uh, risks which are in fact, uh, creating much more damage to heritage. And we are not able to see them because they are happening slowly, uh, which, for example, includes weathering or the impact of uh, vegetation growth or termites or uh, the impact of salts coming uh, through wind. So we have these slow 
uh, slow events, which are in fact creating much more damage. It's once we realize it's maybe too late to, to do anything about it. So when we talk about uh, these risks, we have to really understand that it's not just uh, these catastrophic events, but they are also uh, slow and progressive events which are of equal importance. Now let's look at uh, very briefly about uh, the vulnerability of heritage to these events. What is it that's making these, this cultural heritage so much vulnerable to these disasters or risks that we, we are concerned about? And one most important vulnerability factor is urbanization. And if you look at the way the world is getting urbanized, uh, one could see that the, the statistics show it's dramatic, how, what's happening in these cities, how uh, we, we see that for the number of people living in cities have equal to those in villages in 2007. That's a, you can see that where the red and the yellow uh, graphs just coincide with each other. And you can see how dramatic is the urban growth projected from here to 2025. And in developing countries like India and China, one could imagine that heritage site which is located in these urban areas, how much change of context it's that heritage is going to witness. And what that change in context is going to do to this heritage, how much more vulnerable it's going to make it. And it's not just that it's getting densified, it's also about the number of people who are living around these sites. So it's not just about the vulnerability of the physical fabric, it's also vulnerability of human beings, the communities who are connected to this heritage and how vulnerable they are becoming, not just the physical uh, physical form. And I'm just going to show this example from Mumbai, uh, where you have the fabric which is traditional and then you have this new reality coming up both of them are both these realities are juxtaposed with each other where you have the the old the historic the traditional and you have new buildings coming right next to it so one can just imagine this is the scenario we are dealing with with most of the heritage that is in developing part of the world and i would say not just developing it's also in the developed and that we are here in tower of london and we look around we can see the kind of changing context and the vulnerability that kind of poses but when we talk about cities, we many times forget about small and medium-sized towns. And in many parts of the world, and especially in developing countries, situation is very different than in mega cities. <laughs> in many of these smaller towns, in fact, there is a reverse process happening. People are moving out of these because there is not enough livelihood there. There is not enough job opportunities there. So people are moving out like this important town, which is really like an open air exhibition uh, of uh, murals all over uh, in the city, where there are no, not enough jobs and so people are just moving out. Uh, it's in the western part of India. And then these important heritage structures are just lying abundant. There is nobody to take care of them. There is nobody to maintain them. And so they are also becoming increasingly vulnerable. So when we talk about earthquakes or floods or these large events, we forget that it's the vulnerability because of these factors which we have to address and not just look at or focus only on the earthquake or the events which catch our attention. And this is just to give you another uh, example of uh, the dramatic change that urbanization is doing to heritage. This is Kyoto in, uh, in uh, Japan. And the red dots show all the heritage sites which are in world heritage in Kyoto. And this is the way, and all the blue dots that you see scattered around is, are all urbanized. This is all urbanized area in the basin of Kyoto. But if you look at historically, so you, the square that you see here is the historic uh, capital of Kyoto. And if you look at historic uh, um, map of Kyoto, that was what, how it was uh, in 1890. So from 1890 to 2005, not much uh, time. If you look at the long uh, series of uh, time zone, time horizon, one would say that is just, uh, just uh, very little time in that long horizon of time, and we could see the kind of change that has happened. And all these red dots, which were not so much uh, in, uh, un, in, uh, surrounded by urban areas, are now very much uh, uh, surrounded by this kind of development. So when you have these kind of narrow streets, narrow developments, when you have new infrastructure, all these access to these heritage sites has become very uh, uh, narrow. And the, if 
a disaster happens and if there are a lot of visitors in these heritage sites, one could just imagine that they would be trapped. And there would be also a problem of uh, access of emergency services to approach and save these heritage sites. Uh, another example, and then if we have disasters like what we had in Kobe, in 1995 when there was an earthquake and that was followed by fire and in fact fire created much more damage than earthquake then one could just imagine how much heritage would be lost in heritage sites like Kyoto where there is all this wooden heritage that is extremely vulnerable to, to fire. Uh, let's look at another situation in Kathmandu Valley, Nepal. Again this is a World Heritage Monument Zone. You see these uh, very important uh, heritage site. There are enough open spaces inside. It looks quite safe, but it is not. If we look at the surroundings, this is the kind of urban context within which this World Heritage Site is. Even if the World Heritage Site is very well protected, let's look at what's happening around that World Heritage Site. And when we look at the kind of transformations that are happening in the housing around these sites, and one has to understand that this is a site which is really, really vulnerable to earthquake. And we are, in fact, expecting a big earthquake to strike this uh, Kathmandu Valley in the next 30 years. And if that kind of situation arises, unfortunately, which is very much predicted, one could just understand that it's not just the heritage site that's vulnerable, it's also its surrounding context. And much more risks are there if we don't look at the heritage along with the larger urban development. And that's one of the challenges that we have where when a when lot of our heritage site is in fact located within urban environments that are changing very, very dramatically. Uh, a map that just uh, where we have just uh, overlaid uh, earthquake hotspots with all the world hated sites, which are cultural and natural sites. And if we overlay them, we can just understand how many of these world hated sites are exposed to earthquakes because they are lying on the earth earthquake. Uh, earthquake zones. So with this kind of uh, scenario, we can just imagine that earthquake is indeed a big risk for heritage sites uh, in around the world. And I'm going to talk about another, another case which has been already uh, discussed before. And it is important uh, because this also brings out another very important issue, and that's uh, with relation to how much understanding do we have about her our heritage sites, and how much more we need to find out in order to really address risk to these sites. We have uh, some our Korean colleagues here, and they would be able to tell this story very much in detail. But I just want to highlight one issue uh, where this important cultural property, which was put on number one list of uh, Korea was, uh, was destroyed because of arson that happened a few years ago. If you look at what was the reason why so much damage happened, and I'm giving, uh, and this is all due to the work done by my uh, colleague uh, from Korea who has been working on this, and also his uh, other uh, colleagues are here as well, is because there has, was not a good understanding of how fire is gonna spread from that heritage building. So when the fire engines came in, they didn't, they thought that the fire has been extinguished, but they didn't have the knowledge that fire was actually trapped inside. They just couldn't see it from outside because they didn't have the knowledge of how the building is gonna behave if there is a fire then they could not really respond properly. They thought that the fire is extinguished, but suddenly they found that, in fact, fire had engulfed all over the, all the building from inside, but it was just not visible from outside. So how important it is, and that's where I think SciArt's mission is so important, because it will bring out all these details, the complexities of heritage buildings that we don't understand and know unless we document them, unless we really have a good understanding of how the building is gonna be and how it is gonna behave if there is any disaster. So that's the reason why we lost this, uh, which, uh, which we all know about, and now we uh, fortunately have this re restored. Uh, another big issue with the heritage sites is uh, lack of uh, evacuation procedures in place. And we find that this is another example where uh, this important museum was, uh, was badly damaged. And they could not just rescue these heritage objects inside from the normal uh, 
exits and uh, entries. So they had to break, over, break open the roof and take the structures from out. Now, why I'm showing this example is, unless you have, any, have a good understanding of how you're going to uh, deal with the heritage building, if there is a disaster, there, then only you will be able to respond properly. Otherwise, if you think that your normal exits and entries are going to serve the purpose, it, it's generally not the situation when disasters take place. I come back to the situation on Ayodhya, where uh, in Thailand, where there was uh, flooding uh, two years ago. And I want to show one important aspect of uh, disasters here. If you look at Ayodhya, we just wonder how come so much flooding has happened in this site, especially when we look at the traditional system. In fact, Ayutthaya has a, had a very interesting traditional water management system. There were three rivers, uh, which you could see from there, and the, the network of canals through the, through the site would, or would very uh, easily drain the water away from the site so that there is no flooding in the site. But what kind of situation is, why the things are really changing now? Uh, let's look at this, uh, uh, this graph. We see that, and this is just to bring out how important is the uh, for us to really understand how things are really changing. Uh, there were uh, the water level was 3.7 meters from average uh, before the construction of two major dams. In fact, two major dams were constructed uh, in two. Uh, this is the timeline of around 20, 30 years ago. And then we find that the average water level is actually decreased. So we would imagine that there would be no floods because the water level has been decreased because dams have been constructed. But let me show you the next diagram where you, in fact, see what's the intensity of flood levels. And you suddenly start to see from 1972 onwards to 2012 how, much, how the intensity is increasing. So we tend to forget that averaging the rainfall doesn't really give us the, the real situation. The real situation is known when we know how many instances of high flood frequency happened and how this led to floods. So this kind of an understanding of the changing climatic pattern is very important. And we can see from these graphs that hydrometeorological events are actually on the rise. And these are also dramatically increasing as this, this graph uh, shows. And this, these maps just show how these world heritage cities, which are prone to floods, and this, uh, this is prepared by World Bank, and it just shows these dark uh, purple uh, dots are those world heritage cities which are extremely vulnerable to flooding. And one could just imagine uh, how much heritage is at risk now when we look at these important heritage cities which are, which are prone to uh, floods. Uh, with, and if we take climate change into account and we look at also associated events, because we tend to forget that many times flooding is associated with landslides as well. So when we talk about earthquakes, they are associated with fires. They can also lead to landslides. And we have to look at all these events as multiple events that, that would create uh, disasters and a loss of heritage site. So, uh, so one should look at the likely scenarios, and I'm just going to just state these few scenarios that can uh, take reality, uh, be real for cultural heritage. We can very easily see increased conflicts over scarce resources. Water would be the main cause of the conflict in the future. This has already been uh, mentioned many times, and this is a reality. And this would make certain heritage sites vulnerable to exploitation and looting. Because if water is scarce, there would be conflicts, and these hated sites would become vulnerable to that. We generally don't tend to associate these linkages, but it's important that we try to understand that there can be many linkages that could put heritage sites at risk. Flooding, as I mentioned before, it might be less frequent, but there might be very heavy rainfall, and that may trigger other disasters such as landslides. Heritage sites in extremely dry areas may be at risk due to forest fires. Uh, some sites, especially coastal heritage sites, uh, might be uh, you know, uh, prone to sea level rise, and they might be getting submerged. For example, some of the sites are already experiencing that uh, in the coastline. We will see examples in Bangladesh where this is already happening. This is already happening at the moment. And of course, there would be impact on people. Uh, living sites where uh, people have been inhabiting these heritage sites may get abandoned, and that might affect the intangible heritage. So 
there would be a lot of impacts that uh, that can happen if these scenarios unfold as we unfortunately uh, believe that they may so risk management is indeed a paradigm shift and how does it become a paradigm shift uh, First of all, we are very much used to making condition assessment. We just see what is the damage today, and we, are, we do some fixing of that damage, and we think that that's going to solve the issue. But from moving from identification of present condition to assessing potential impacts in the future, and developing resulting scenarios. It really changes our thought process because we are not looking at what's there now. What we are trying to really look at is what might happen in the future. It is also very much about prioritizing based on the impact, potential impact on heritage values besides people's lives and livelihoods. And that's where I would say our very important work lies because we are used to looking at impacts on people's lives, livelihoods, but probably we need to put values, heritage values or heritage significance as also an important indicator along with these other factors that we must, uh, must, must look at for the potential impact. It also changes the way we look at conservation. As I said, it's not about reactive conservation, fixing problems. It is about, uh, in fact, preventive uh, care and management. It's about maintaining them. It's about monitoring them. It again changes the whole way we are used to dealing with the heritage sites. And of course, it's about reducing risks by reducing vulnerabilities. I showed you some examples to talk about the kind of vulnerabilities that we have to our heritage sites. It's about looking at those vulnerabilities and trying to understand what can we do to reduce those vulnerabilities and exposure uh, of cultural heritage uh, related to hazards or threats. So integrated framework, I'm going to uh, very uh, briefly elaborate on that. We, for risk management of cultural heritage that we have to really take into account should really consider multiple hazards or threats. So not just earthquakes, not just fires, but all kinds of threats that a heritage site might be exposed to. We should look at multiple vulnerabilities, uh, and we should take into account all the attributes of the site and, uh, and should look at all those hazards or threats to which uh, those, uh, they are vulnerable. Uh, we should look at the degree of exposure, who is exposed? Many times in heritage sites, there are people who are living there. So, which kind, who are exposed to, uh, to the heritage, uh, to to these uh, threats, and where they are exposed? It's important to look at uh, the exposure aspect of risk as well, and of course, potential impact, as I mentioned, on heritage attributes and associated values, people's safety, economy, and livelihoods. So, this kind of integrated framework of looking at risks for heritage sites is something that we must really work on in order to really prepare our sites for the, for the future. And this really brings into account three different parameters that we have to put together. The probability of these kind of threats that we are talking about, the uncertainty factor, which is very important to take into account, uh, depending on the kind of information that we have with us, or the information that we need to reduce the uncertainty. And again, here I feel that the work of SciArc is very important because it will help us reduce that level of uncertainty that we have at this moment for us to assess these risks. And then to put uh, on the third uh, uh, level the heritage values. And that's where we will be able to be really able to prioritize and take effective actions. And use uh, innovative tools, uh, use GIS, for example, to really assess risk, to make risk maps which would be very helpful to take decisions. And risk management is important because if you look at the statistics which was compiled by World Heritage Center, one would see that 37% per of the World Heritage sites, all these ones in, the, in pink, are not even having any understanding or awareness about risks. Forget about risk management plans. So if you look at this, we really find that more than half of the sites are not at all prepared. And rest of the sites, one have to evaluate what kind of risk management measures are there. So it is a real challenge, and we really need to uh, work very much uh, uh, consistently to, to, to handle it. An issue that I want to bring forward, which is very much relevant for us in working with heritage, is the kind of separation we have with development development sector, disaster management sector, and the heritage sector. We really are not working together. And that is another problem, which is increasing risk. Or we are not able to reduce risk, because many times disaster management division, or the department, or the people working there have no link with those who are managing the sites. So how can we effectively exchange information? How can we have a common language is, is really a, a challenge that we have to look at. And it means that we have to look at culture as much more 
transversal, not as a separate category, but as something which is connected to all the other sectors with which if we talk about water, if we talk about housing, we talk about uh, planning, all those have a cultural element to it. And what's important is to look at that. And also not to talk just about fighting about risk, fighting with risk, but with climate change, in fact, adaptation becomes a, also an important aspect that we have to consider. Not just about reducing all those risks, but also trying to understand how can we adapt our sites to changing climatic conditions, to changing situations that we, that we witness. I'm going to come to the end of my presentation by making a case that we should not just look at heritage as a victim. And it's very important now that we start looking at heritage also as an asset. And what does that mean? It means that in many, many places we have found that Heritage sites have become very important sources of saving people's lives. In Kathmandu Valley, these kind of open spaces. In many of these heritage uh, sites, you have water systems, which can be really useful during emergency situations. Uh, also, there are many buildings that have survived earthquakes, like this one in Kashmir, which, was, which could survive impact of earthquakes where all the new buildings collapsed. Now, what does that mean? Again, a mission of SciArc is very useful here, because if we understand this traditional knowledge, we are able to understand what kind of asset this heritage can become for reducing risks to site. And this is just a real example that happened in Japan, when there, where there was tsunami and earthquake uh, just uh, two years ago. And if you look at these temples, which were located at very strategic location at the higher level, many people could survive because they could escape to these temple areas. They could just climb those steps and go up and could save from tsunami. And in fact, this, this thing that you see here, the black plaque, shows that there were 200 school kids who could survive in this temple because they could just run up and, and take a shelter there when tsunami struck. So heritage actually has a role to play. It should not be just seen as something which is uh, very weak, vulnerable, and, and, and has to be just saved. So we have to really build capacity. We need, really need to do a lot of work to build capacity. We have started some work, uh, but we need much more work to, be, uh, to, to, to do so that site managers are really able to do something uh, to protect heritage. Uh, also, we have, uh, I just want to mention about this initiative we had in C Syria, where we organized the e-based learning course for ECOMOS, uh, where all the resource people, in fact, gave uh, some kind of basic lessons to site managers. Uh, these are all the site managers who were sitting in Damascus muse uh, Museum. They all collected together, and we gave uh, some kind of presentations about basic things that they could do to protect sites in this critical situation. So there's a lot, and there's a lot of work that needs to be done, but there are some initiatives that have just begun, but there's much more that we need to do. These are the publications that have been uh, just uh, developed in this area. So I'm ending with these key challenges that I would like to just uh, mention. The first is that there's a need to build capacity at regional, national, and local levels for various types of target groups, including decision makers. We need to develop and implement disaster risk management plans for various cultural heritage sites. We have to understand that different kinds of sites have different kinds of risks and different kinds of needs. So we need to look at archaeological sites, historic cities, vernacular cultural landscapes, and should look at all kinds of risks, uh, threats, from, uh, from the momentary threats to the slow, th uh, slow threats, as I mentioned. We further need to mainstream cultural heritage in wider disaster management field. And we need to, as I mentioned before, link culture with various sectors, such as infrastructure, livelihood, sustainable development. It's, it's really about plugging into existing networks and programs. Uh, research and development of tools and guidelines, and I feel that the work that SIAC is doing is really contributing to this, which is going to really help in achieving other ends. And of course, working on low cost and culturally sensitive technology for mitigating disaster risks to cultural heritage. So with these, I would just end my presentation with this one line, which is that if we have to reduce risks to cultural heritage, uh, we are really able to, which has been in fact mentioned earlier as well, protect the present of our past for the future generations. And that's what risk is all about. Risk management is all about. Thank you so much.